Ismail Muhammad. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Well, we know what time it is. While I have had the distinct honor of introducing in my mind and what I believe and know based upon my limited time on this earth, one of the greatest men to ever walk this planet and to ever serve humanity, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. We are here today because the masses of our people are suffering. And in the words of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, our people are on a death march into the oven of social, political, economic, and educational deterioration. We are here today because God again has reached out for us to do what we have failed to do yesterday and that is to stand and unite as a people. Help me brothers and sisters to welcome the wonderful human being in person that will introduce the minister. It is none other than his daughter. Please welcome minister Donna Farrakhan Mohammed, who will introduce her father, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. Please receive her. Check one, two. In the name of Allah, the Beneficent, the Merciful, I bear witness there is no God but Allah, and I bear witness that Muhammad is his messenger. I bear witness to Moses and the Torah, and yes, I bear witness to Jesus in the Gospel. In their holy and righteous names, I would like to greet my brothers and my sisters, with the nation's greetings of peace and paradise of assalamu alaikum. We are here today because it is the 10th anniversary of the Million Man March. This day, our black men made a holiday for righteousness and righteous principles. We Thank Almighty God Allah for the man who had the vision to bring black men together. And we thank black men for standing up for the black family like you've never stood before in the history of white America. We also thank you, the women who you invited this time to join you on this 10th anniversary. We came to stand by our men. We came to support the black man. We know that you are the best. And we know that you are for us. God has given you a queen. Although taken down and our crown was removed when we came to this country, he sent us a man, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, to return us back to the throne of queen. But we couldn't go back until you stood up, black man. And we thank you for standing. We thank the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan for being that example to the black race to let you know that if God is with you, who can be against you? He lets you know 
that you have to fear no one but God because God is present today. He is showing you his power. He chose a man, the Honorable Louis Farrakhan, in your midst, raised him from the dead to allow you to see black man that if you return to Almighty God, you too can be repaired and restored to your greatness. But you won't go it alone. We the black women, we will return to our creator and we will take our rightful place by your side. A righteous black woman representing God and we will stand by our man and we will rebuild this civilization. We thank Almighty God for the strength and the courage of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. And we stand here and we support him and we trust him. All praise is due to Allah. I bring you the man that you all have been waiting for. The man that has given all of us courage today to be the best that we can be. The Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. In the name of Allah, the Beneficent, the Merciful, we give him praise and thanks for his goodness and his mercy, for all of his prophets and their scriptures, for Moses, for Jesus, for Muhammad, peace be upon these worthy servants of Allah. I am a student of the most honorable Elijah Muhammad and I could never thank Allah enough for his intervention in our affairs in the person of Master Farad Muhammad the great Mahdi or the guided one who came among us 75 years ago and raised the honorable Elijah Muhammad as our leader teacher and guide I greet all of you, my dear brothers and sisters, with the greeting words of peace. Assalamu alaikum. First, I would like to thank Almighty God who gave us such a beautiful, beautiful day. We thank him for getting each of you safely here and we pray that he will take us safely back to our places of abode. It was not I who rushed the program. I was sitting watching on television and uh, everyone has said so much I really wanted to hear Mother Tainetta Muhammad, Sister India Ari, but I thank you for considering bringing me forward before the sun went down. There's so much that has already been said, but I can't start without thanking the National Director the Reverend Willie Wilson, 
all of the national co-conveners. I would like to thank Kathy Hughes and Jonathan Rogers of Radio and TV One and Russell Simmons and all of the members of the hip hop community. But the most important thing that has happened that has never happened in our history has happened today. And that is that we have seen an unprecedented number of black leaders of organizations coming together to speak to America and the world with one voice. This has never happened before in our history that our whole spectrum of black thought was represented here on the stage in front of the capital of the United States of America. This tells us that a new day is dawning in America and the world, starting with the unity of the dry bones in the valley. This is more than a moment in time for no matter how many came, and I can't hazard a guess as to how many are here, I will let those who do that best say that. But if there's a million or less or more, the meaning of this day is not today. The meaning of this day will be determined by what we do tomorrow to create a movement, a real movement among our people. I'm very grateful for the members of the Native American community and the Latino community that came to show solidarity. And I don't want our Native American brothers and sisters to feel that they are window dressed. But I want our Native brothers and sisters to feel that the time has never been more ripe for a strategic relationship between the black, the brown, the Native American and the poor of this nation and the world. I thank the Honorable P.J. Patterson, Prime Minister of Jamaica. I thank the head of the National Assembly, Brother Alacon, representing President Fidel Castro for their words that they spoke to us. I thank all of those who had a word to say. And I thank the hard-working brothers and sisters who made this day possible. I personally thank all of the members of the FOI and the MGT who went out and got our people to pay for what you see on this mall today. We didn't ask any white philanthropist to give us their money that they may tell us who could speak and who could not. Everything that you see in front of you and around you is paid for by the hard work of those who support the Millions More Movement. I am deeply grateful to all of you. So much has been said, it's very little really for me to talk about except to give some marching orders. Katrina showed us the neglect 
of the government of the United States of America, the failure of state government, federal government, local government to answer the critical needs of our people. But I put more attention on the federal government because there were four hurricanes last year that hit Florida. And there was no neglect or very little that we read of, certainly no great loss of life. What happened to the federal government's response to the suffering victims of Katrina and what lessons are we to learn from this? I believe that we can charge the government with criminal neglect of the people of New Orleans, Louisiana, Mississippi, and Louisiana in particular. I believe, and we need to look into it, since we can't sue the federal government, we can sue Homeland Security and FEMA for criminal neglect, I think we need to look at a class action suit on behalf of the citizens of New Orleans who have lost everything and the government is not acting responsibly to give them back what they have lost and return them to their homes. A mother has a child on a hot day in her car and she runs into the supermarket to get something but she locks the door and the windows. She stays a little longer than she had planned and when she comes out, her child is dead. Certainly it was not her intention to kill her child, but the law says it was criminal neglect. Five days, the government did not act. Lives were lost. I can't say what the intention was. I'll leave it to others to make that determination. But I firmly believe that if the people on those rooftops had blonde hair and blue eyes and pale skin, something would have been done in a more timely manner. We charge America with criminal neglect. I hope that the lawyers will look into that because a class action suit on behalf of those who have suffered is absolutely necessary. We need to call witnesses to witness stands under the, the uh, oath of being able to be charged with perjury. We want to know what happened to the levy. We don't want to guess about it. We don't want to be guilty of following rumors. We want to know what happened on that levy that caused the suffering of so many thousands of people. And now they're saying they don't even want to rebuild the Ninth Ward. So where will those people live? Don't worry about government. They won't do what they should do if we don't do what we must do. I understand that there are nearly 2,500 of our children missing. Nobody seems to know where they are. That's a crime of great proportions 
in a country where I recently learned 70,000 children from poor nations around the globe are here in America in child slavery, in sex slavery. These are children from outside America. Where are our children? Can we stand by and allow it to be said that 2,500 of our babies are missing and we will not rise up as a people to demand to know where our children are? That's an ugly picture, brothers and sisters. And those kinds of pictures will continue until and unless we see the need to organize and to mobilize. I heard all the demands of today. I heard all of the pain of today. And as I listen to this pain, I know that the power to end the pain is not here. The power to end the pain is with those of us who are here and those of us who may be watching that we're going back home to organize. On the 1st of September in Atlanta, Georgia, a meeting of the elders took place that was inspired by a five-year-old girl who was having a bad day in Florida. And we saw police put that little girl in handcuffs and put her in the back of a police car and shackled her feet. And her mother came and the police authority would not release that child to her mother. They're being sued today, but the picture that is left is that our grandparents, our parents, our youth, we've seen them all in chains. But now a new picture has evolved. We're seeing our babies in chains. Our people are being herded into the criminal justice system. So Harry Belafonte, not only a great folk singer, but a marvelous and wonderful humanitarian, he said on that day, one of his heroes is Eleanor Roosevelt. And he said that Eleanor Roosevelt invited him to the White House along with black leaders such as the distinguished A. Philip Randolph. And at the dinner table with the President Franklin Delano Roosevelt, A. Philip Randolph rose to run down a litany of abuses of black people and a litany of things that President Roosevelt could do to ease those abuses. And Mr. Belafonte said when A. Philip Randolph finished, the president did not speak immediately. He opened a box of cigars and passed cigars around to everyone at the table. And then he said to A. Philip Randolph, Everything that you said about the abuses of your people, I agree with. And everything that you said I could do to end those abuses, I agree with. He said, but Philip, there's something that I want you to do. And Mr. Randolph said, and what is that, Mr. President? And the President Roosevelt said to A. Philip Randolph, go and make me do it. Now I want you to reflect 
on those words as we stand on the Capitol steps and on this great Washington Mall, President Roosevelt may have been willing to do it, but he knew that if we didn't organize enough force to make him do it, those around him would have stopped him from doing it. As it was during the time of Roosevelt, it comes all the way up to President Bush. The government will never do for the poor of this nation until and unless we organize effectively to make government respond to the needs of the poor. So the burden is not on this. The burden is on us. Our 43 members of Congress, brilliant as they are, committed as they are, are impotent without the organization of those of us who need to see change but they can't bring it asking for H.R. 40 that has not even come out of committee yet and other good legislation that will never see the light of day as long as the masses of the people are not organized to make government do what they don't have the moral correctness to do. You would make a mistake and waste valuable time thinking that there is moral correctness to serve the needs of the poor. That we must dispel. We must go back home and organize as never before. Let me give you a picture to take with you. Katrina grew to a number 12 tropical storm. And then she grew to become a category one hurricane. What was the difference between Katrina as a number 12 tropical storm and a category one hurricane. It was the degree of organization within that storm. The more organized it became, it went up in category to two, to three, to four, to five. And then you saw people fleeing by the hundreds of thousands, fearing the consequence of the onslaught of a number four or number five hurricane. What is the lesson? The more we are organized, the more we can generate power to change reality. The more we unify, the more power we can generate to change reality. I thank God for the leaders that spoke today, and I pray that we all are sincere. But I think that all of us in leadership need to be made accountable. because there are those who are lip professors who will come among us and say, surely we are with you. But when they are alone, as the Quran says, with their devils, they say, we are only mocking. But Allah says in the Quran, in their hearts is a disease. And Allah increases that disease because they lie. I want all of the leaders 
This is a very dangerous time to play with the destiny of the people. I want all of us, if you love life, then don't play games with the destiny of a people who are crying to breathe free. Organizing is serious. And there are those who don't want to see us unified. This is written of in scripture. There's a picture, I think it's in the book of Daniel, of a great image of a head of gold, a breastplate of silver, legs of iron, and a feet of iron mixed with miry clay. Gold is the heaviest metal. That's the head, so it's top heavy. That's the rich. The breastplate of silver, the next richest. But the legs that support the head of gold have feet that have iron mixed with miry clay. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad taught us that that foot represented the weakness of the world that we are living in. We're living in a world where the rich are a few and the poor are many. But it is the poor that are supporting the rich, and that's why the rich hate anyone who can stimulate the consciousness of the poor. Those of you who are Christian, it was the poor that heard the message of Jesus gladly. And because they heard his message gladly, the Roman rulers were frightened of Jesus and they had to come against him because stirring the poor is like messing with those feet of iron mixed with miry clay since it was a weak foundation for such a heavy head. If you disturb the poor, the rich come down. So a movement here is dangerous to a few, but that few have power over many. Are you sure that you want a movement? Are you sure that you want to organize effectively to change your reality? If you are sure, then be ready for severe opposition. There is no idea worth anything that is not tested by opposition. Opposition is as necessary as the wind that blows and the sun that shines in order to test the strength of the idea and the strength of those who support the idea and the commitment of those to the idea. We are going to be tested by opposition. So when we go back home, know that our work has just begun. What should we do when we go back home? Since the government has shown us that they really don't care, we can't let another catastrophe come 
and we are not prepared. Do you agree? The Bible says, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, but the Word didn't stay a Word. The Word became flesh and dwelled among men. It makes no difference what we say, because a lot of us are good talkers. But it will make a difference what we do. What we say can only become flesh if we go from this place and mobilize and organize street by street, block by block, house by house, so that we can accomplish that which we desire for the good of ourselves and our people. Now, it seems to me that I want to ask some questions. And I hope you will be ready to respond properly. I think that we should form a ministry of health and human service. Think about this. Since Jesus said, those who would be chief among you, let them be your servant, then we in leadership and our organizations are not to master the people but to serve the people. So if such a disaster comes again, we need a ministry of health and human service to look after the health needs of the black, the brown, the Native American, and the poor. President Castro offered America over 1,500 doctors that spoke English to help with the tragedy of Katrina. Our government, very proud, did not accept those doctors. I think we should find a way to accept them because our people need medical attention. If the government won't permit us to do that, we have a just cause to make them show a just cause why we who have hospitals closing in Washington and in cities across the country, why don't we need doctors? Now, President Castro has offered blacks in America 500 scholarships to go to Cuba to study medicine with only one stipulation. And that stipulation is that we must bring that medical knowledge back and practice it in our own communities. Let's take Fidel Castro up on that offer, and I'm asking all of our doctors, when we go back home, let us form a ministry of health and human service that we can use to serve the needs of the black, the brown, the red, and the poor of this nation. We need a ministry of agriculture. The black farmers are suffering. We need to unite our black farmers, make their land productive, and tie that land to the needs of the city. A ministry of agriculture. 
the Native Americans have the largest tracts of land and they are willing, according to what I learned from Brother Bob Brown of the All African People's Revolutionary Party, they are willing to lease millions of acres if we are ready to go to work to do what? As long as we keep our mouth in the kitchen of our enemy, we will never have good health. We must provide food for ourselves because the merchants of death are feeding the American people and they are tied to the pharmaceutical companies. They create disease on one hand through the improper raising of food and livestock and then they make pills on the other hand to correct what they've created. We need a ministry of agriculture because farming is the engine of every nation and we need to provide for ourselves the things that we consume and this will cause us to want to build supermarkets in every city. This will cause us to want to build canning factories and frozen food factories so we can take our product from the ground and can it, take our product from the ground and freeze it and put it into our own supermarkets. This we can do, it's not a big thing. It's just we need to think out of the box. A ministry of agriculture. We need a ministry of education. Let's unite all of our educators because the Western system of education has run its course and is no longer worthy to hold our children or America's children. We are calling on our educators to provide a new educational paradigm. And if our educators form themselves into a ministry, a service, then we will be able to re-educate our children and others and make a productive people. We need a ministry of defense. Did you hear me? Look at all these young brothers. They are born soldiers, but they're in the wrong war. They're fighting a war in the streets of America against each other, or they're fighting in an unjust war.